to Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. If you'd like to get an email once a week with upcoming sleep stories and other news, subscribe to the Snoozeletter at snoozecast.com. This episode is brought to you by Fair and Flowing Handwriting. Tonight, we shall read the next part of Pride and Prejudice, written by Jane Austen. If you'd like to listen to this series easily in order, please go to snoozecast.com slash series. In the last episode, Mr. Collins finally moves on from asking for Lizzie's hand in marriage but he hasn't moved on from his visit at the Bennett's home. Jane receives a disturbing letter from Caroline Bingley and reads it to Lizzie. The sisters have opposite interpretations. Jane believes Caroline that her brother Charles has moved on to a new love interest in Georgiana Darcy. Lizzie guesses that Caroline is scheming to marry Mr. Darcy and as part of her devious plan that she is trying to break up the love between Jane and Charles. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Take a few deep breaths. Chapter 22 The Bennets were engaged to dine with the Lucases, and again during the chief of the day was Miss Lucas so kind as to listen to Mr. Collins. Elizabeth took an opportunity of thanking her. It keeps him in good humor, said she, and I am more obliged to you than I can express. Charlotte assured her friend of her satisfaction in being useful, and that it amply repaid her for the little sacrifice of her time. This was very amiable, but Charlotte's kindness extended farther than Elizabeth had any conception of. Its object was nothing else than to secure her from any return of Mr. Collins's addresses by engaging them towards herself. Such was Miss Lucas's scheme, and appearances were so favorable that when they parted at night, she would have felt almost secure of success if he had not been to leave Hertfordshire so very soon. But here she did injustice to the fire and independence of his character, for it led him to escape out of Longburn House the next morning with admirable slyness, and hasten to Lucas Lodge to throw himself at her feet. He was anxious to avoid the notice of his cousins from a conviction that if they saw him depart, they could not fail to conjecture his design, and he was not willing to have the attempt known till its success might be known likewise for though feeling almost secure, and with reason, for Charlotte had been tolerably encouraging, he was comparatively diffident since the adventure of Wednesday. His reception, however, was of the most flattering kind. Miss Lucas perceived him from an upper window as he walked towards the house, and instantly set out to meet him accidentally in the lane. 
but little had she dared to hope that so much love and eloquence awaited her there. In as short a time as Mr. Collins's long speeches would allow, everything was settled between them to the satisfaction of both, and as they entered the house, he earnestly entreated her to name the day that was to make him the happiest of men. And though such a solicitation must be waived for the present, the lady felt no inclination to trifle with his happiness. The stupidity with which he was favored by nature must guard his courtship from any charm that could make a woman wish for its continuance. And Miss Lucas, who accepted him solely from the pure and disinterested desire of an establishment, cared not how soon that establishment were gained. Sir William and Lady Lucas were speedily applied to for their consent, and it was bestowed with a most joyful alacrity. Mr. Collins's present circumstances made it a most eligible match for their daughter, to whom they could give little fortune, and his prospects of future wealth were exceedingly fair. Lady Lucas began directly to calculate, with more interest than the matter had ever excited before, how many years longer Mr. Bennet was likely to live and Sir William gave it as his decided opinion that whenever Mr. Collins should be in possession of the Longbourn estate, it would be highly expedient that both he and his wife should make their appearance at St. James's. The whole family, in short, were properly overjoyed on the occasion. The younger girls formed hopes of coming out a year or two sooner than they might otherwise have done, and the boys were relieved from their apprehension of Charlotte's dying an old maid. Charlotte herself was tolerably composed. She had gained her point and had time to consider it. Her reflections were in general satisfactory. Mr. Collins, to be sure, was neither sensible nor agreeable. His society was irksome, and his attachment to her must be imaginary. But still, he would be her husband. Without thinking highly either of men or matrimony, marriage had always been her object. It was the only provision for well-educated young women of small fortune, and however uncertain of giving happiness, must be their pleasantest preservative from want. This preservative she had now obtained, and, at the age of twenty-seven, without having ever been handsome, she felt all the good luck of it. The least agreeable circumstance in the business was the surprise it must occasion to Elizabeth Bennet, whose friendship she valued beyond that of any other person. Elizabeth would wonder, and probably would blame her, and though her resolution was not to be shaken, her feelings must be hurt by such a disapprobation. She resolved to give her the information herself, and therefore charged Mr. Collins, when he returned to Longburn to dinner, to drop no hint of what had passed before any of the family. A promise of secrecy was of course very dutifully given, but it could not be kept without difficulty, 
for the curiosity excited by his long absence burst forth in such very direct questions on his return as required some ingenuity to evade and he was at the same time exercising great self-denial, for he was longing to publish his prosperous love. As he was to begin his journey too early on the morrow to see any of the family, the ceremony of leave-taking was performed when the ladies moved for the night. And Mrs. Bennet, with great politeness and cordiality, said how happy they should be to see him at Longbarn again, whenever his engagements might allow him to visit them. My dear madam, he replied, this invitation is particularly gratifying, because it is what I have been hoping to receive, and you may be very certain that I shall avail myself of it as soon as possible. They were all astonished, and Mr. Bennet, who could by no means wish for so speedy a return, immediately said, But is there not danger of Lady Catherine's disapprobation here, my good sir? You had better neglect your relations, then run the risk of offending your patroness. My dear sir, replied Mr. Collins, I am particularly obliged to you for this friendly caution, and you may depend upon my not taking so material a step without her ladyship's concurrence. You cannot be too much upon your guard. Risk anything rather than her displeasure and if you find it likely to be raised by your coming to us again, which I should think exceedingly probable, stay quietly at home and be satisfied that we shall take no offense. Believe me, my dear sir, my gratitude is warmly excited by such affectionate attention, and depend upon it. You will speedily receive from me a letter of thanks for this and for every other mark of your regard during my stay in Hertfordshire. As for my fair cousins, though my absence may not be long enough to render it necessary, I shall now take the liberty of wishing them health and happiness, not excepting my cousin Elizabeth. With proper civilities, the ladies then withdrew all of them equally surprised that he meditated a quick return. Mrs. Bennet wished to understand by it that he thought of paying his addresses to one of her younger girls, and Mary might have been prevailed on to accept him. She rated his abilities much higher than any of the others. There was a solidity in his reflections which often struck her, and though by no means so clever as herself, she thought that if encouraged to read and improve himself by such an example as hers, he might become a very agreeable companion. But on the following morning, every hope of this kind was done away. Miss Lucas called soon after breakfast, and in a private conference with Elizabeth, related the event of the day before. The possibility of Mr. Collins's fancying himself in love with her friend had once occurred to Elizabeth within the last day or two, but that Charlotte could encourage him seemed almost as far from possibility as she could encourage him herself and her astonishment was consequently so great as to overcome at first the bounds of decorum, and she could not help crying out, Engaged to Mr. Collins? My dear Charlotte, impossible. 
the steady countenance which Miss Lucas had commanded in telling her story gave way to a momentary confusion here on receiving so direct a reproach, though, as it was no more than she expected, she soon regained her composure and calmly replied, Why should you be surprised, my dear Eliza? Do you think it incredible that Mr. Collins should be able to procure any woman's good opinion because he was not so happy as to succeed with you? But Elizabeth had now recollected herself and, making a strong effort for it, was able to assure with tolerable firmness that the prospect of their relationship was highly grateful to her and that she wished her all imaginable happiness. I see what you are feeling, replied Charlotte. You must be surprised, very much surprised, so lately as Mr. Collins was wishing to marry you. But when you have had time to think it over, I hope you will be satisfied with what I have done. I am not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only for a comfortable home. And, considering Mr. Collins's character, connection, and situation in life, I am convinced that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Elizabeth quietly answered, Undoubtedly and after an awkward pause, they returned to the rest of the family. Charlotte did not stay much longer, and Elizabeth was then left to reflect on what she had heard. It was a long time before she became at all reconciled to the idea of so unsuitable a match. The strangeness of Mr. Collins's making two offers of marriage within three days was nothing in comparison of his being now accepted. She had always felt that Charlotte's opinion of matrimony was not exactly like her own, but she had not supposed it to be possible that, when called into action, she would have sacrificed every better feeling to worldly advantage. Charlotte, the wife of Mr. Collins, was a most humiliating picture. And to the pang of a friend disgracing herself and sunk in her esteem was added the distressing conviction that it was impossible for that friend to be tolerably happy in the lot she had chosen. Chapter 23 Elizabeth was sitting with her mother and sisters, reflecting on what she had heard, and doubting whether she was authorized to mention it, when Sir William Lucas himself appeared, sent by his daughter, to announce her engagement to the family. With many compliments to them, and much self-gratulation on the prospect of a connection between the houses, he unfolded the matter to an audience not merely wondering, but incredulous. For Mrs. Bennet, with more perseverance than politeness, protested he must be entirely mistaken. And Lydia, always unguarded and often uncivil, boisterously exclaimed, Good Lord, Sir William, how can you tell such a story? Do not you know that Mr. Collins wants to marry Lizzie? Nothing 
less than the complacence of a courtier could have borne without anger such treatment. But Sir William's good breeding carried him through it all. And though he begged leave to be positive as to the truth of his information, he listened to all their impertinence with the most forbearing courtesy. Elizabeth, feeling it incumbent on her to relieve him from so unpleasant a situation, now put herself forward to confirm his account by mentioning her prior knowledge of it from Charlotte herself and endeavored to put a stop to the exclamations of her mother and sisters by the earnestness of her congratulations to Sir William, in which she was readily joined by Jane, and by making a variety of remarks on the happiness that might be accepted from the match, the excellent character of Mr. Collins, and the convenient distance of Hunsford from London. Mrs. Bennet was in fact too much overpowered to say a great deal while Sir William remained, but no sooner had he left them than her feelings found a rapid vent. In the first place, she persisted in disbelieving the whole of the matter. Secondly, she was very sure that Mr. Collins had been taken in. Thirdly, she trusted that they would never be happy together. And fourthly, that the match might be broken off. Two inferences, however, were plainly deduced from the whole. One, that Elizabeth was the real cause of the mischief. And the other, that she herself had been barbarously misused by them all, and on these two points she principally dwelt during the rest of the day. Nothing could console, and nothing could appease her. Nor did that day wear out her resentment. A week elapsed, before she could see Elizabeth without scolding her. A month passed away before she could speak to Sir William or Lady Lucas without being rude. And many months were gone before she could at all forgive their daughter. Mr. Bennet's emotions were much more tranquil on the occasion, and such as he did experience he pronounced to be of a most agreeable sort, for it gratified him, he said, to discover that Charlotte Lucas, whom he had been used to think tolerably sensible, was as foolish as his wife, and more foolish than his daughter. Jane confessed herself a little surprised at the match, but she said less of her astonishment than of her earnest desire for their happiness. Nor could Elizabeth persuade her to consider it as improbable. Kitty and Lydia were far from envying Miss Lucas, for Mr. Collins was only a clergyman, and it affected them in no other way than as a piece of news to spread at Meryton. Lady Lucas could not be insensible of triumph on being able to retort on Mrs. Bennet the comfort of having a daughter well married, and she called at Longburn rather oftener than usual to say how happy she was, though Mrs. Bennet's sour looks and ill-natured remarks might have been enough to drive happiness away. Between Elizabeth and Charlotte, there was a restraint which kept them mutually silent on the subject, 
and Elizabeth felt persuaded that no real confidence could ever subsist between them again. Her disappointment in Charlotte made her turn with fonder regard to her sister, of whose rectitude and delicacy she was sure her opinion could never be shaken, and for whose happiness she grew daily more anxious, as Bingley had now been gone a week, and nothing more was heard of his return. Jane had sent Caroline an early answer to her letter, and was counting the days till she might reasonably hope to hear again. The promised letter of thanks from Mr. Collins arrived on Tuesday, addressed to their father, and written with all the solemnity of gratitude which a twelve months abode in the family might have prompted. After discharging his conscience on that head, he proceeded to inform them, with many rapturous expressions, of his happiness in having obtained the affection of their amiable neighbor, Miss Lucas, and then explained that it was merely with the view of enjoying her society he had been so ready to close with their kind wish of seeing him again at Longburn, whither he hoped to be able to return on Monday fortnight, for Lady Catherine, he added, so heartily approved his marriage that she wished it to take place as soon as possible, which he trusted would be an unanswerable argument with his amiable Charlotte to name an early day for making him the happiest of men. Mr. Collins's return into Hertfordshire was no longer a matter of pleasure to Mrs. Bennet. On the contrary, she was as much disposed to complain of it as her husband. It was very strange that he should come to Longburn instead of to Lucas Lodge, it was also very inconvenient and exceedingly troublesome. She hated having visitors in the house while her health was so indifferent. And lovers were of all people the most disagreeable. Such were the gentle murmurs of Mrs. Bennet, and they gave way only to the greater distress of Mr. Bingley's continued absence. Neither Jane nor Elizabeth were comfortable on the subject. Day after day passed away without bringing any other tidings of him than the report which shortly prevailed in Meryton of his coming no more to Netherfield the whole winter. A report which highly incensed Mrs. Bennet in which she never failed to contradict as a most scandalous falsehood. Even Elizabeth began to fear, not that Bingley was indifferent, but that his sisters would be successful in keeping him away. Unwilling as she was to admit an idea so destructive of Jane's happiness, and so dishonorable to the stability of her lover, she could not prevent its frequently occurring. The united efforts of his two unfeeling sisters, and of his overpowering friend, assisted by the attractions of Miss Darcy, and the amusements of London, might be too much, she feared for the strength of his attachment. As for Jane, her anxiety under this suspense was, of course, more painful than Elizabeth's. But whatever she felt, 
she was desirous of concealing. And between herself and Elizabeth, therefore, the subject was never alluded to.